Good morrow, my friends. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm gonna review another book about the Middle Ages as a sort of follow-up to my last review on the Canterbury Tales, but this time this is a contemporary book. It's a history book called A Distant Mirror, The Calamitous 14th Century by Barbara Tuckman. And I've been meaning to read a Barbara Tuckman book for ages now. She was a prominent popular historian back in the day who is best known for writing books on the 20th century, especially The Guns of August, which won a Pulitzer Prize. So for her to write a big-ass brick of a book like this about the Middle Ages is quite the departure for her. Uh, it's about, like, not just the Middle Ages, but the 1300s specifically. It focuses on events like the Papal Schism, the Black Plague, the Hundred Years' War, and various peasant revolts. Uh, it focuses mostly on England and France, but because international politics were intertwined, much like they are today, uh, the narrative sort of spills over into other countries like Italy or the Eastern Roman Empire and other countries like that. But of course, it isn't easy to fit a hundred years worth of history into just a 700 page book, so how she sort of combats that is she makes the book sort of a combination of narrative history and historical survey. So with the narrative, she has a story that is straightforward and sort of anchors the book and makes it easier to follow. But the survey aspect of it makes her able to delve into the broader aspects of medieval society and make you understand what the day-to-day -day was like for most people. The narrative is focused on a guy named Enguerrand de Cussy VII who is a French noble, and he gets wrapped up in a lot of the book's events. He fights in a lot of wars, he travels a lot, and he ends up getting on good terms with French and English kings. So you follow him, but you don't really meet him until like 200 pages into the book. And until that happens, Tuckman sort of lays the groundwork for the world that Kusi will come into later on, and even when Kusi does enter the narrative, she continues to take opportunities for tangents as they present themselves in the narrative. So like, when Kusi gets married, uh, Tuckman gives us a chapter on domestic life and marriage and how women were treated in the cult of Mary and stuff like that. <laughs> so her sort of mixture of those two historical styles allows her the flexibility to give you the big events and the story that you can sink your teeth into while also sort of coloring and shading all of the little details that you would hope for in a book like this. While I did sometimes get lost on a lot of the details when I was going through this book because uh, it's pretty complicated despite Tuckman's attempts to sort of simplify it, I was still able to come away with a good general impression of the trends and forces that characterized the 1300s. One of the biggest ones being that people were really getting fed up and disillusioned with these institutions that had been rock solid, like you could not question them. So the church, uh, the military, and the monarchies were starting to look pretty bad because War was so perpetual in the 1300s, like, I thought it was bad now, but, like, it, I swear to God, it's like they're trying to fill a schedule. They're like, oh, I'm sorry, my lord, I know you want me to come over and fight this war, but I'm fighting my own war over here, so maybe I can squeeze you in in the summertime and come over and help you kill people. And, like, <laughs> the church at one point tries to intervene in the Hundred Years' War to stop France and England from fighting each other. But it's it's not for any good reason. They're just like, oh, could you guys really need to stop fighting so that you can help us go kill these Muslims over here. And it, as soon as there's a lull in the Hundred Years' War, people are just scrambling to figure out where they can send their militaries next, because if they don't do that, then the disbanded militaries will all just take up arms themselves and go around pillaging villages and stuff. So throw, throw into the mix the Black Plague and the Papal Schism, and people were getting really fucking sick and tired of all these high and mighty people trying to always be at the top of society, so there were a lot of peasant rebellions and things like that. This irreverence that was coming up in the lower classes really explains a lot of the satire that I was reading in the Canterbury Tales, for example. By pointing out all the ways that old social institutions were kind of being questioned, 
Tuckman is trying to frame the 14th century as a huge turning point in Western European thinking and society, where she kind of says that events in this book foreshadow big changes of society that would come later, like the Renaissance and the Protestant Reformation and even the French Revolution. And of course the book is called A Distant Mirror because she's trying to compare the events of the turbulent 14th century with events of her own time. Tuckman grew up in the, 19th, in the 20th century, so she grew up with two world wars, she grew up with the Spanish flu, and all this social upheaval. So she, it makes sense to compare it, but at the same time, a lot of things like social upheaval and war and disease are ubiquitous throughout history, and it makes just as much sense to compare our own time to the 14th century as it does to compare it to just about any other time. On the other hand, though, we're sort of naturally wired to relate things back to our own experience, and depending on who you are, you'll probably find different aspects of this book to relate to your own time. So I think what Tuckman was trying to do is just get the reader used to the idea of comparing the past to your present day and using the past as sort of a learning tool. And I think that's a really valuable thing to learn how to do when you're reading history. So even though you could relate a lot of this stuff to any other time in history, I still am happy that Tuckman took the time to try to make the reader think that way. I did have a few problems with the book, though. For the most part, Tuckman is pretty good at navigating the complicated history and giving you a lot of information without bogging you down too much or making things confusing, but there's definitely parts where she just completely lost me, and I had to go consult Wikipedia just for a, a basic sequence of events or for the definitions of different authority positions within the church and state. Like, I still don't really know the difference between a duke and a count, for example. I also find that at a certain point, her tangents start to make the narrative more confusing as opposed to fleshing it out, where she'll spend a couple of pages on something that seems to come out of nowhere, and then you're wondering whether or not you have to retain it for later or what. And then, of course, there's Kusi himself, and you begin to question why she decided to anchor the book around the guy, because he dies, like, before a lot of the main sequences in, in the book are concluded. The Papal Schism and the Hundred Years' War are still going, and then Kusi dies, and then the book ends. <laughs> uh, but these problems are kind of mitigated by the fact that the book still has a very climactic final few chapters that I really enjoyed, and also it's kind of mitigated because the conclusion to the book ties up all the little loose ends and gives you the information for how like the papal schism and stuff like that resolved. So it's not the worst thing, but these problems were still detractors for me. For the most part, I definitely enjoyed A Distant Mirror. I would recommend it if you're looking to get into this time period, but maybe read a couple of Wikipedia articles first. Obviously I had some issues with the clarity and the structuring in certain places, but overall it was a pretty good introduction to the 1300s and it gave me a lot of like first looks into the biggest events that characterized the century. I'm definitely looking to read more, but the next time I do it'll probably be a little bit more focused. Uh, but yeah, overall the book gets a 7 out of 10 for me. And um, if you know of anything from the Middle Ages, whether it be history books or stories written at the time, please let me know, because this is definitely a subject matter I plan on returning to. Um, you know, I definitely want to read Frossard's Chronicles now, <laughs> because that gets mentioned a lot in this book. But uh, yeah, I guess that'll have to wait, because that's the end of this review. I made it to the end of another one, guys. So uh, thank you for watching, and yeah. Uh, we're, we're done. We're done. Bye.